Hi, I'm Spiros Skensos, and welcome to Comic-Con at Home 2021. I'm your moderator for the 11th annual Intro to TV Writing Panel. A quick housekeeping note, please don't block the aisles, and please don't rush the podium afterwards. Comic-Con needs to prep this room for the next panel. <laughs> um, let me introduce you to these awesomely talented people who are going to talk to us about how to put your best script forward. Bo Yan Kim and Erica Lippolt are an international genre-loving writing team who've written for hour-long dramas such as Rain, Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Section 31, and Halo. They're currently serving as co-EPs on an upcoming Netflix show. Sean Crouch started his writing career on Numbers, then created the internet viral hit One Minute Time Machine. His credits also include running the Exorcist and Lore, and he just finished as a co-EP on the final season of CW's The 100. He's currently in development on a few projects. Jade Adan Hall is the director of current series at Lionsgate TV, where he creatively oversees shows on the air, including Dear White People, Run the World, and the upcoming Heels. He's previously overseen series at BET, the Disney Channel, and Disney X, including such series as Mech H4. He holds a BA in psychology and an MFA in television, radio, and film from Syracuse University. And Jamie O'Brien created and show ran Nosferatu for AMC. She's currently showrunning season two of Industry for HBO as part of her overall deal. And she was recently a consulting producer on In Treatment and has written for Fear the Walking Dead, Hell on Wheels, Big Love, and Flesh and Bone, among others. I hope you're all giving them a big round of applause from wherever you are. You guys, thanks so much for being here and spending an hour with us today. I really appreciate that. Um, let's jump right in and get started with writing our scripts. For TV streaming primetime, there's basically two types of scripts. There's the script you can um, write of an existing show, a spec script, and then an original pilot script. So let's talk about specking a show first. Why is it important to try to spec a show when starting out? And who should do this? Bowie, would you like to get that conversation started? Yeah, of course. And thanks for, for having us. Um, I think this forever discussion of spec versus pilot. Like it's a discussion that comes back on Twitter like every five months and everyone has an opinion about it. Um, and honestly, my own stance is do both because I think um, doing spec scripts, I mean, at a sort of a practical level, it's primarily currently used just to um, apply for fellowships. So the TV fellowships, which are NBC, CBS, Fox, ABC. Now there is a couple more like HBO. Um, what am I forgetting? There's there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of lists on the internet where you can look up. Um, and specs are one of the requirements for a lot of these applications. But at a more sort of a career training level, I think spec scripts are a really great training tool to see if you can mimic the voice of a show, the voice of the showrunner who created the shows. Um, and I think ultimately it's all great practice for you to have once you get staffed on a show, because once you're on staff and once you are writing scripts on the show, um, it's your job to understand what the showrunner wants, what the voice of the show is. Um, so I think to be able to say, hey, I, I spec a couple of stuff before, it tells the showrunner, hey, I've actually practiced being a good staff writer before um, and had the practice of mimicking voices. Um, so yeah. I think it's, yeah. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, I think that's a great point. Cause so often, you know, you're brought in for, because you have an interesting voice, but the producer's like, all right, now do my voice. And I don't know if you guys want to speak to that in, rela in, relations to, um, in relation to a spec script. Yeah, um, I, I think as a staff writer, obviously you were hired because you had a unique voice, either your showrunner loved your pilot, but it's on the staff writer to then read if there are you know previous scripts from the season or if the pilot script is available it's on you to study it like down to like punctuation and whether or not your showrunner wants one spaces or two spaces um because if what you ultimately turn in um as a staff writer is very different from what the showrunner usually the, the way they write or the voice they wanted for the show then you're giving your showrunner extra work to do rewrites so i think it's it's kind of a, a sort of a it feels like it's a very contradicting thing where you're you're being hired for your voice but you're also having to mimic the showrunner's voice too um and i think that's kind of the fun of being a tv writer because you're ultimately figuring out okay, like I, I need to do what is best for the show, but I'm gonna 
also be able to infuse something that my showrunner can't do, but they'll ultimately have to approve, obviously. Um, right. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun, delicate balance that I think the staff writer has to try to spec scripts sort of the start of sort of that training. That's great. Yeah, I appreciate that uh, input on that angle. Um, do you, do the others here uh, read a lot of spec scripts? Like, and when you do, like, what are you looking for when you're reading those? I think, well, let me, I'll, I'll jump in unless anybody else wants to take this one. Um, go for we it. actually, so I'll go to the contrary. We actually read zero six spec scripts in terms of, you know, staffing um, and current. And then also, um, you know, when I was working in development and I still do development now uh, on the 1619 project at Lionsgate, we don't read specs simply because that voice is so important. I think it's a really, really great tool, especially early in your career to, you know, practice the, the basics of writing and to get into those programs. But I think when you're really trying to stand out, um, you know, amongst uh, just a sea of people and a sea of writers, having that really great original sample is important. I will say, um, Prentice Penny, uh, who's a friend, who's a showrunner insecure, uh, the way he always described it to me as, you know, being a young staff writer was the best point of view that he thought was to, to really understand like you're helping someone else make their show and their vision, right? And so, you know, he, he, he equated it to sort of the showrunner has a paintbrush and you as a staff writer are whatever color paint he needs, right? Or she needs, yeah. right? Okay, I need you to be green today. Maybe that's mimic my voice. I need something really unique from you because you have perspective on it. Maybe that's a red, right? But whatever you need in that room, um, he or she needs you to be. And I think yeah. as much as you can sort of internalize that and realize that when you go in the room that you're there to sort of support them and help sort of develop that show. Uh, I think it works really well for young writers to look at it that way. That's a really uh, good point. Um, I want to get more into uh, original pilot writing in a second, but I also wanted to finish up with some nuts and bolts about writing a spec of an existing show since those are still used in a lot of uh, programs and it's a great way for a writer to understand a show. So Erica, could you talk to us a little bit about the importance when you're specking a show of like knowing the show, what kind of research needs to be done, how it should, what's important with th tone and theme and pu even punctuation grammar, like can you just, what do you look for in that spec? Yeah, so Bowie kind of touched on this uh, already, but certainly the main thing to keep in mind when you're writing a spec of an existing show is you're trying to write an episode of that show. So you need to do your research. Most shows have scripts available somewhere. You can search online for them. Uh, the WGA library also has some available, but do your, do your homework. Um, find examples of scripts of that show that exist make sure you are really capturing the style of writing. You know, if it's an action heavy show, take a look at how they write action. If it's dialogue heavy, make sure you're really capturing the voices of the characters. And structure, as stuff as basic as how many acts do they do? Do they do a teaser? Do they do a cold open? Make sure you're really matching the format of the show. And then the trick on that is to make sure you're also doing something a little different. So it's a balancing act of, can you write an episode that feels like it fits within the structure and the format of the show that exists? But then you're infusing that little extra thing that is purely you. You know, how are you doing a twist on it that is still true to what the show is? So, you know, like you don't want to be going off and just creating a whole bunch of new characters that are taking the story away from the main characters. You want to sort of create something new within what's already there. Like you wanna make sure the focus is still on your protagonists and you're still sort of matching what is expected of an episode. Like, do you expect this to be a, a open and shut case if it's a procedural or is it serialized? If it's serialized, that's a little trickier. You need to find something that can sort of fit seamlessly within the existing show. That's not sort of going off and doing something that's probably going to be done. If the show's, you know, coming up, there's a new season. You don't wanna sort of do the obvious next step because that's probably going to be what the next episode of the show is. So finding yeah. something that can sort of exist within the world on its own is really important. I think that's a great point you bring up because I, you know, I've done a lot of reading for programs. I've been through the pro through a pr couple programs, and I've noticed that sometimes people will write a spec of an existing show that is like, say, like a serialized show like The Flash or something, 
and their spec will have a cliffhanger ending. And, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm like, you haven't finished the story, you know, and I think that's important to emphasize that like, you can write a serialized show, but you still have to finish the story as part of your spec, right? Totally. And yeah, I think um, just to jump in real quick, you know, I think the norm is you try to find like that standalone story within, if it is serialized, or even if it's a procedural um, uh, uh, show, I think there's still a little bit of a serialized character element. Uh, so that's usually the norm. That said, you know, there was someone in our program, we went through the CBS Writers Mentoring Program, and her spec was she actually wrote the first imaginary episode, the season opener of Fourth and Black. And it was great. And it like, you know, she, but there, it was close ended. And like, she managed to find like a really interesting season. I think it was like three opener or something. And I thought that was such a ballsy move, but it worked because yeah. she had a lot of confidence going in to be able to pull that off. So, you know, there are exceptions to the rule. And if you are going to do that, just make sure you, 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 you know what you're doing <laughs> and then you do it with confidence. I think it's that big swing, right? Like, yeah. You, you should take a big swing, but just know that it's either going to land and people are going to love it, or it's just going to be crickets. Exactly. Um, I'm sure other, I don't know if others of you have read any of these like mashup scripts where it's like Mary Tyler Moore meets Orphan Black or like something like that, that those are often attention getting uh, scripts, but you know, there are pros and cons to those. It's almost like, I think like, it's like you want to write like a very special episode of the show, kind of, you know what I mean? Like, and, and I'm going to reveal point. my age here, but it's like, I think about like the Subway episode of Homicide or oh. the Pop Barons episode of Sopranos, like, and you know, no, no pressure. Cause these are like classic, <laughs> classic <laughs> um, examples of television, but it's like, you want to, that's kind of, I think what you're reaching for. It's like, you want to honor the show and in a weird way, like write, like the best episode of it <laughs> um, or like the episode that you as a fan of it, cause I wouldn't spec a show that you weren't a huge fan of would just like die to see. Um, I think is like a good way to, you just want to reach yeah. for something that's a little bit outside of what it typically is, but could still be contained by it. Yeah. Yeah. No that's matter what, no matter what genre um, I'm specking, I always think of the twilight zone first. Mm. And I try to think of fitting that this is a Twilight Zone episode of the show. Where and, and I don't that's mean supernatural good. necessarily, but in some fashion that it's gonna have a little bit of a twist and a beginning, a middle, and an end for that. At least one like you know, Lost was very easy to do because it already was set up like that. But I just picked what I did a spec of Lost and I just picked one character and I told his story in that one and, and you know had a Twilight Zone type feel to it. So I totally agree with that. The, the very special, showing my age, the very special episode <laughs> is yeah. a really smart way of specking. That's a great way to go about it. I think that is essentially, you guys have hit it in the nail on the head. It's like, it's a it comes from a point of view that only you can share. It's totally in vain of, with the show, but it is super unique and special. I think that's great. Um, all right, so moving on, like I know that the trend used to be to write specs of the show, like, you know, this is like decades past and now it's become more of a trend to have an original pilot. And now, you know, it, every time I do this panel, I get different uh, points of views from EP. Some of them want a spec if they're reading an unproven writer, others may want a pilot. What are your thoughts on that, Sean? Cause it sounds like you've attached, you've attached it, attacked it both ways. I have, since I go back decades back, um, <laughs> when I first started, it was all spec. It was like, if you had a pilot, that's great. They'll read that fourth after they read yeah. three specs before then. So specking, because I worked in development at that time, specking ruined um, West Wing and Sopranos for me because right. those were specced by everybody. So I read 10 West Wings a day, 10 Sopranos a day from young writers. And now my memory, I love those shows. I can't remember what was in the show versus what were some of the specs I read. Because there were some <laughs> so, such fantastic specs yeah. that they've lived in my head as an episode and they were never produced. So, um, but that's the way the business has changed. Nowadays, yeah. I don't, when I'm staffing a show, I really don't want to read a spec. Um, I want to read their voice because that's who I'm hiring in the room. I want 
a really cool diverse room that has nine different voices, nine different people, and I want nine different pilots. So I know what I'm hiring because I'm hiring them. As anyone who's worked with me, I'm hiring their family because I'm going to get all those stories from them. Everything in the room is going to be their voice. So that's what I want to know. And if and I think every writer I've worked with is a great writer, so they will catch up to the voice of the show, I think. But even if they don't, it's going through my computer last, you know, a lot of times. So I can fix the last few little voice pieces. So I'm not as worried about that because I'm going to be around. Yeah. Um, so that's why I want. I want pilots nowadays. I want their special, fresh voice to, who's coming into the room. Right. No, that totally makes sense. And of course, when we when we were talking about decades ago, it was certainly not a pejorative term as far as an, an ageist term, but it was like, no, no it was. Know, up until the past, you know, recent 10 years, it was all, you know, we just want specs and we'll read your pilot once you're an EP. Yeah. Um, but what you were saying about the original voice is great. And Jamie, I was hoping that you could talk to us more as well and uh, chime in about what purpose uh, an original pilot serves and how those work as far as uh, another sample, you know, another arrow in your a quiver. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just second second everything that Sean said. Um, it shows that you have a voice. It shows that you have something to say. It shows me what you're interested in writing about. It sh you know, it it shows um, kind of how you approach writing. You know, the the last time I was reading to staff a show, oftentimes when I'm reading to staff a show, the thing that's tough is that in Hollywood, there are a lot, a lot of pretty good writers. And so how are you gonna, like, how is your sample gonna be better than that? And um, in, a, in, a, in a town where everybody is pretty skilled, I think it comes down to whether or not you can interest me as a reader, as a busy person who reads a lot, just being blunt. Um, and, um, and also like, I don't know, I wanna see you on the page. Like, it's funny because what I was starting to say and I kind of got sidetracked is like, the last time I was reading to staff a show, like I read like 10 pilots that all started with two guys who were buddies who were working at a strip club. And then there was a <laughs> boxing, like they were in a boxing gym. And, 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 and I was like, wow, this is the thing this season. And, and I feel like what that was, was generated by agents or managers or what, was perceived to be the marketplace. And I just think like, put all of that aside. I mean, that's good if you're trying to develop something and that's what people have asked you to do. But right. I don't actually think those things are great samples um, because they all, even if they're very competently put together, they start to become a wash. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I, I, I've kind of pivoted off your question a little no, bit. You're, think, no, it's, it's great. You're, uh, you're absolutely right. Write, write what you want to write as a pilot. Don't chase what your agent or manager, don't chase the marketplace. Write what you care about, what you're passionate about, because that will come through to me. And I want that passion in the room. Yes. I want someone who's dying to be a TV writer. And yeah, I, yeah it's like, I, it's good just to see the courage of your convictions on the page, you know? Yeah. And that's so important. I can't tell you how many times I've had agents say, oh, don't write that. And then I write it. And that's the thing that gets yeah. me into a program mm -hmm. or gets me, you know, into a showrunner meeting and stuff. So I think that's just a really good point, everyone, to remember to write what you're passionate about and use your voice to sell. It's it's a calling card. You're selling yourself, you know, as much as a script. And um, since we're talking about that, let's talk about, because you were talking, Jim, you had mentioned uh, keeping your interest and, and it, you were saying like, sorry to be blunt, but like, that's the job. Like, you're trying to keep people's interest. So let's talk about the first 10 pages. We always hear about the first 10 pages are so important. Why are they so important? What are we looking for when you read when you read a script? Jade, as our exec, if you want to get us started on this part of the conversation, um, then we can you know, open it up to all the other writers. But like, what's those first 10 pages for you? Yeah, sure. I think that, you know, they're they're really, really important. I think, and for the reasons that everybody has talked about in terms of wanting to see the person on the page, right? So like that, that those first 10 pages, you can't really wait to reveal yourself, right? Like you want to have someone presenting, one, a point of view that is unique, but also that is an actual point of view. I can't tell you how many times I start reading scripts and it's sort of from this very like removed third person point of view where it's like I'm, I'm watching somebody buy a cup of coffee. It's like, 
I want to feel like the tension of like, while they're waiting in line, why they need that coffee so bad or what is, you know, how do I get into the character and get into the mindset of, again, as Jamie was saying, like, what do you have to say? What are you trying to say, you know, with this scene? And if you don't have that underlying subtext of wanting to say something, then, you know, people who read a lot, even if they can't articulate it, they can tell. And there's a real difference between that and, um, you know, someone who isn't doing that. So I think in the first 10 pages, you really want to be, I mean, as throughout your script, but you really want to be intentional and have that subtext built in. Yeah, and just to, to jump in on that point, um, Bowie and I went through our, our first experience uh, staffing a show recently. And like Jamie was saying, it is overwhelming, the <laughs> amount of scripts you get. It's like, you just physically as a human being do not have time to read all of the scripts you're sent. And so even for me, I'm a completionist. I like to just make sure I, I sort of gave everyone a fair chance. Early on, I was trying to read whole scripts and very, very soon it became clear that was not gonna be possible. And so you do end up really putting a lot of pressure on the first 10 pages of a script you're reading. And you really need to feel like you are understanding what this writer is saying and, and also that they are setting up what the episode is in those first 10 pages. If you're 10 pages in and you're still like, I don't know where this is going or I'm confused about what the point of all of this is, you're gonna drop that script. You need to sort of be able in those first 10 pages to establish who the characters are, what their drives are, what their goals and wants are and sort of what is the, the sort of conflict that is going to be driving the story in that, in that script. Yeah, um, um, I'm sorry, were you going to jump in, Sean? No. Or Jade? Someone was, I thought someone was jumping in. Sorry. Um, I, just I, said I agreed. It was. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that it's so important. A lot of people forget um, when, especially when they're starting, when you're starting off, like the first 10 pages is everything. You've got to establish the character and you've got to establish the goal for the episode or else we don't know what we're following. And the first, that's why they, people talk about the first 10 pages being important, right? So um, writers out there, like, uh, we, I know we write for ourselves and to tell our stories, but it's important to remember that you're also writing to get a job from people who are executives like Jade, who might be staffing or looking to hire a writer to, to develop a project. And you're also writing for these showrunners who are definitely, you know, looking when they read, they're looking to hire people. So with that in mind, you guys, um, when you're reading, what are you looking out for? Or I know we talked about kind of like what excites you, but if you guys want to chime in about what excites you and what are some turnoffs? Like what are some common beginner mistakes that would send a red flag up to you when you're reading a spec? I mean, I'll just, I, the, what turns me off, um, it's just, I'll give a couple of pet peeves. Uh, and this yes. is, is what thankfully now, I think we're seeing less and less of, but any kind of like misogynist language turns me off. Um, even if you think it's cute, even if you think it's funny, turns me off. Anytime we start at the heels and pan up someone's legs, I'm out. Anytime. And then it's like sometimes, and sometimes it's just a taste thing. Like if the focus is on a car, I'm out. Like if it, if it feels like something that is cliche, I'm out. And I think, you know, in terms of like what I'm looking for is a peculiar worldview that's got something interesting in it that's got either some humor, some tragedy, some humanity, or like best case scenario, all three, you know, um, something that's humane and a little bit weird. <laughs> Great. No, I think it's really important for people to hear that. Yeah, the the weird, the, I, I like the risk taking, and, and I think it, this has been mentioned a few times, that almost 80% of specs I read are pretty vanilla, pretty much try not to try and just to, to throw a fastball down the middle. And those aren't the ones that live with me. It's the ones that take a risk. And sometimes they don't work. I've hired writers where it didn't work at all, but I love that they tried it. And I said, I want that feeling in the room. I want someone that's going to just try crazy stuff and it doesn't work most of the time, yeah. but they just keep going and keep going and keep going. And that's what I get from a script like that and from anybody who's taking risks. So I want to read, I want to read those risk taking, but as as Jamie pointed out, the right way. It's not it's not risky to use misogynistic language like it's a 1995, you know, homicide thriller anymore. 
You know, we're past that. Like, what what's going to be what's going to be passe in 25 years from now? That's going to be risky now. So do that. Do something new and interesting. Yeah, if I can jump in, like I, yeah. I, I think as someone reading, you know, usually to give give notes or advice or to staff, like I always want to something something that I think the greatest compliment to me and what I you know want to give is like, oh my god, I never thought to do that, or just this person yeah. is contributing or doing something on the page that I'll never be able to do. And, you know, ultimately that's the person I want in the room because then yeah. they can they can do that for me. Um, so again, like if, if that happens in the first 10 pages, like great, like then I can expect the rest of the script to be just as good. Um, so I think finding, figuring out what you're really good at or your unique perspective, your unique background, profession, whatever it is, um, and figuring out how to include that on the page and uh, as your pilot sample um i think is is always such a big plus for for a writer trying to staff or trying to get into a fellowship that's how you stand out mm -hmm. that's, like that that's great yeah and i'd, I'd say go ahead Sarah. no so i was anyone any other thoughts on that definitely want to hear yeah i'll jump in um i think for me i'm looking for kind of really specific stuff um because i think there are backbones to what make good writing and so I'm always really looking for how does someone handle relationships, right? Because, you know, we are very, very social animals and that's sort of underlying whatever genre we're telling, right? When you're, when you're doing like a genre piece or any kind of piece, you need that sort of human connection that's underneath it, right? It's like you look at, um, you know, like Endgame um, and Infinity War, like in some ways it's a father-daughter story, right? Like, so you have to have sort of what is the human connection underneath it. And then secondly, we've talked about this a little bit, is like not what's happening, but what is it about? And sort of in that, I think that one of the mistakes that young writers make um, or, or folks who are just not sort of up to the level that we're looking for is they have things constantly happening to the character as opposed to the character making a choice and those things happening resulting from that choice. Right, I always give people the example of Spider-Man, um, why he's so compelling is because, you know, he can sort of stop the robber, but then he allows that person to go and that person winds up killing Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben, right? So that's what makes it so tragic. Not that Uncle Ben died, but that he had a chance to stop it and he didn't do it and he, he didn't make that choice. And so now we understand what he's about and where he's coming from and where he's going to. So I think that, um, you know, really, Focusing on those things uh, for me helps stuff stand out. That's a really great point. Um, what you and what Jamie said earlier too about focusing on cars and stuff, it's like, we're telling stories about humanity. We're telling stories about people and you can have all of the zombies and space explosions and what have you, but if we don't care about the characters, then what's the point, right? Like it's, we're talking about character characters on the page. Even more um, so we're talking about we're trying to trick your brain into believing that the characters on the page are real people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what, okay, so we've heard a lot in the, we hear people talk about in panels about writing what you know from personal experiences. Does this mean you're writing about today I drove to the store or are we talking about emo emotional truths? Definitely talking about emotional <laughs> truths. <laughs> um, yeah, like I think that the, the core of that sort of advice is just write something that is authentic to you. Like it's, it, that feels authentic and truthful to you and what you're trying to say. And that doesn't mean like in abs or sort of in concrete terms, it doesn't mean literally what your physical experience, like life experiences have been, although that can be part of it. Like there's going to be an automatic, automatic truthfulness to something that is sort of drawn from your life. But I feel like what's more important is sort of making sure that you believe what you're writing, you know, like that is not just some empty copy of what you've seen done before. Like you don't want to be, just be chasing trends or just trying to repeat what's been done before. You want to sort of be saying something with it and saying something that you believe and want to say and have out there. Great. That's great. I think it's important for people to hear that and understand that. Um, so guys, if since so many of you work in the genre space, if we want, should we all be writing genre specs and pilots if we want to work on a genre show? 
Like if I want to write on the 100 or the Walking Dead or the Expanse type of show, should I only be writing genre samples? Not, not necessarily. I mean, oh. not for me. I mean, when, when I was staffing Nosferatu, I, um, again, because I kind of started, a lot of pilots started feeling similar to me. I started reading plays and they, they just, just because I was interested in them. Um, and, uh, yeah, they could be, I read two panders. I read one man shows. I read, you know, that had nothing to do with fantasy or, um, and I also read stuff that did. I, I again, I, I always go back to, I think the most important thing is to feel like this is a person who has passion, who has a point of view, who has a voice, who is a good writer and write something that's gonna crackle um, in some way. And, uh, and, and if that's with zombies, awesome. And if it's with a uh, broken heart, that has nothing to do with zombies, like that's just as awesome. Um, you know, again, it's a little cliche, but I feel like I wanna be moved and um, whether or not you are interested in the same kind of world building as I am uh, is not really the point actually, because if hopefully if, if you wanna, if you're, if you're trying to get staffed on, the, on a genre show, you at least have some interest in it. So if the sample doesn't quite, match exactly i i i don't think it's a problem i i'm with i'm with jamie on this one as well i like to read and if it's a if it's a great pilot it's a great pilot and i want that writer because if it's a great period piece from the 1820s and it's romantic and beautiful i can just drop a zombie in there later that's fine too so i know that they can do i know they can do the hard part the genre to me is a lot of the fun and i can help with that because i have a big genre background but I will say, however, if you can have two specs, have two specs and have a genre spec, because there are executives that won't, will only read genre, too. And there are showrunners who will only read genre in that place. And then maybe they'll read your passion pilot second. So if you can, I would have one genre as a backup. You know, if you can. It's a lot of work, though, too, to have two really great specs. But you, you, a lot of times you'll need to anyway, because they'll say, what else, what else have you read? What else have you written, Sean? I want to read something else to make sure that you're not just a one hit wonder, you know, or whatever, why ever that people ask for a second script from me. Right. <laughs> um, this brings up an interesting uh, question too. I often tell people when I'm teaching and in, in, in lectures and whatnot, people starting off like to at least write two samples a year because your first sample, like everyone's first sample is not good. You know, like it's 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 a really steep learning curve, and you learn you learn by doing, and you learn so much by doing. So the more you write, like if you write one sample then another, then you'll stop stop showing your first sample, right? Then you'll have your second sample and your third sample. Then you'll stop showing your second sample because your third and fourth will be stronger. And uh, if you guys can speak to how that has worked for you, what you've you know the process of specking as as it pertains towards learning and how you view specs, how you've learned from them, any sort of advice in that realm would be uh, really great for people to hear, I think. I'll jump in just from an executive point of view. Um, just a second, jumping back to the last question, this kind of ties in with it. Uh, I totally agree with Sean. It's like, you know, we have, uh, I wish everyone was as open-minded and the town worked <laughs> the way that Jamie does. It would make for much better content. But we have this sort of creative meeting the business side where the rubber reads the road. And there are just folks who can't get their mind wrapped around, oh, this specific type of show is applicable to a genre show. So I would say, you know, sort of sort of have both. Um, but when we're talking about, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the last part of the question though. Oh, just about the importance <laughs> of specking and I like how each spec gets gets you one step closer to being a better yeah, writer. Yeah, and then I would say from an executive standpoint, um, when I talk to young writers, the importance is, Spiro, to what you said in terms of your your first spec not being good. Everyone is going to, to fail and have a process of getting better. And the faster you get better sometimes is the faster you fail, right? Like sometimes you just, you know, you have to go through things to be able to get to the next level. So I have friends who are writers and sometimes, you know, They'll be working on a script and instead of, you know, three to six months, which I think, you know, depending on your level and your level of passion for something is a good time to use. But if you're like, oh, I've been working on this for a year, year and a half, like 
you need to either finish that or let it go because what you're actually doing is getting yourself caught in like this cycle of perfection or a desire to hit perfection and perfect the script. Put it aside. You don't have to let it go forever, but put it for aside for a second, write something else. And then sometimes when you're working through that other thing, you go, oh my goodness, this actually is applicable to the other script that I was working on. And then you can figure out and you can go fix that. But if you stay stuck in that one space, you're not able to keep progressing. Um, I think that's a great point. I've heard people suffer through this before where they've been working on one thing for a year and you know, going and just setting it aside and starting something new can really open up new a whole new world for you. I think I'm so glad you said that. Um, you guys, when we're staffing a room uh, or you're in a room, how do you balance the room from various lived perspectives? How much do, does diversity, unique points of view, underrepresented writers uh, come into what you're looking for in a story? In a, in a writer's room? For me, huge. Um, I need, I, I, I know my story. Um, I'm bored with it a little bit. So <laughs> I need, I need nine other people that are smarter than me that have lived completely different lives and from each other and how they're living their lives now versus how they lived in the past. It's, it's um, extremely important. And that's how you get a great show is having all those different things and then boil them down to your one simple story for that show. Yeah, I, that seems like it's the best way to go. You get more, the more perspectives, the more uh, episodes you have, you know, the more unique points of view you have. I, yeah, I, I think when, I'm sorry, go ahead, guys. Uh, and I was just gonna say that, I, I think there's no negative to diversity. I think the, the more perspectives and life experiences you have, it can only be better. Um, not just for the room and the people in it, but the show um, and ultimately the people watching, it will just touch more people. Um, so there, I, I cannot think of anything bad about making your room diverse as, as, as much as you can. And Jade? Yeah, I think that, you know, for us, when we see a room come together and we're putting one together and we sort of, you're trying to find um, different perspectives, when you see uh, good creative tension, which is, you know, again, the different perspectives, but everybody's pushing in the same direction. Like that's where you get magic. You know what I mean? Where, where you find, I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, we've, we've had a writer sort of fight us on a note, <laughs> you know, initially we get the, they're like, ah, oh, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I don't know about this. And I say, listen, just think about it, you know, and then you go back and they think about it and they come back and they say, oh my God, this actually opened this up really well for me in, in, in a different way. I mean, there's certainly uh, many executives, all of us are uh, guilty of giving bad notes. But I think when you can give the good ones, um, you know, it, it just takes it to a new level. And I think that's the same thing within the room where you're having conversations and maybe you think you're going one direction. And that as an executive, I also love that where you get a second draft, you're like, oh wait, this is different, but this is, and they say, oh yeah, we had a discussion in the room and something came up for someone and so it was actually a unique take on, made this feel a little bit different. And I think if you have sort of people who all have the same type of perspectives and are coming from the same vantage point, you lose out on those opportunities. Yeah, that seems completely 100%. <laughs> um, you guys were quickly run out of time. I can't believe how fast this went, but uh, it would be great to get any you know, last minute thoughts, uh, things that had you known when you first got, when you were first getting started that you could share, um, ways that you stay connected and engaged with writing, especially during this past year that we've had, um, and uh, any like day-to-day -day thoughts about being a writer and what you do and how it goes for you. Anything uh, along that lines would be, I think, really great to end on. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny. Um, I've, I've I've been I've been giving this advice a lot lately. When when I first I um I I studied playwriting in school and when I was graduating I remember I was really scared and the playwright um, Karen Hartman gave me this advice. She said it's fine. This is just the thing. If someone calls you, call them back. If someone does something nice for you, thank them. If someone asks for your script, send it to them. Now, this seems like really simple advice. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I didn't do any of those things because I was terrified and I was a perfectionist. And I was like, I can't send the script because it's not that. like, it's just like all this terror. And, um, you know, looking back at it, it's like, 
you have whatever it is that you do to manage the terror <laughs> that's the that's that's i advise you to find a way to manage the terror because like really i think for us as writers that's the thing that is most holds us back and most keep us from doing the things that we want to do and and that we should be doing and um yeah so if it's running or meditating or therapy um, or journaling or, you know, the artist's way, like whatever it is, find a way to manage the terror, I think is kind of everything really. A, gr a great That's point. Great. And also a great title for a uh, autobiography, Manage the Terror. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that I mean, that's I, I you know, it's finding your tools to do that. Um, I was going to go into that a little bit as well. For me, it's and this is the advice too. I wish I would have given myself 25 years ago was keep writing every day because that will manage the terror for me. If I write even a scene, then I can go about my day and not. But if I don't write, I'm all of a sudden I'm anxious. Like I didn't do something today that I should have done, even if I'm not on deadline, whatever. It just helps me. It helps me then go on to other things without anxiety. And then the second part of that, and then you do that, you write every day, you have those two specs a year. You know, you can, you keep writing and have those specs. And there's been times I didn't have another spec. And I, so I didn't get a job because I didn't have that other spec. So I needed to keep writing. And then the other thing, when you finally get on that show, and let's say I got on a show for like seven years on CBS, you're going to be on that show for a long time. You think you're golden, take meetings. <laughs> I didn't take meetings for like six years. So I, nobody knew who the heck I was when that show was over. And I thought I was fine because I'm working. You don't need to take, no, take meetings, do it. And, and if you're a showrunner, let your people take, take meetings meeting. because everyone needs that next job. Otherwise you're going to be out of, out of work for a year or so. And it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'll, a great point. I'll, ahead, I'll follow that up by saying, uh, I tell younger writers, um, you're an independent business owner and the business is you, right? And so to Sean's point, people get stuck in sort of this, this uh, place of like, oh, well, I'm writing. And it's like, well, who are you meeting? Who are you talking to? Who are like, they say, oh, well, I have agents for that. It's like, actually, that's not really what agents do. Agents are very sort of targeted in that, you know, there's an opportunity, they put you in that opportunity, but they don't necessarily create the opportunity. Right. And so if you're out there meeting people and making connections and I, you know, networking is a little bit of a dirty word. I like to say relationship building. You're meeting people that you actually connect with and that like that you like and that like you. Those are people who are going to help you and you're going to be able to help. And that's how this business works. Like people don't get jobs out of the blue. They get jobs because they know someone connected to that job. And so, you know, you see a lot of writers who maybe are actually physically very talented, but aren't doing that next step. And they're like, well, I'm stuck. I don't know what's happening. I don't, it's like, you don't, you don't have the agency around town to um, you know, create this groundswell for people to want to put you on a show. It's really tough. There's so many people um, you know, that want to do this and, and do this job well. And so as many people as you can know and as many people as you can stay connected to, it just creates bigger opportunities. Yeah, I, I was going to kind of say something similar where, you know, I think the past year have really taught us the importance of human connection and community. And I think a lot of writers, up and coming writers focus on getting reps and getting that first job. And, and obviously all of those things are important things to hustle. But I think the most important tool for the writer is community. Um, and it's, it's not even just like, trying to meet the right people. I mean, it's what Jason is like, it's not so much about the networking and trying to meet the right people, but I think it's trying to meet the best person for you, the best best group of people for you, that you will rise up as the years go on, that they, we will rise together, and then you guys will support each other mentally, but also some maybe sometimes financially in terms of hiring each other and all that. Um, and I think, I think you have to put in the work to be able, like, open yourself up and expose yourself um, to, to even if you're an introvert like me, like, go to those, yeah. go to those mixers, go to Comic Con, yeah. and go to the bar, and and just start talking to people, because you never know what will come out of those meaningful relationships, um, and and for yeah, I, I I find that the most important thing. Yeah, and and to that point, like, on a on a more micro level, like. 
Bowie and I are a writing team and that has been invaluable in us sort of breaking in and rising up because we had each other, we pushed each other and we sort of held each other accountable. So it doesn't have to be a writing partner, but just find the writers around you that you respect and that you like and who sort of get each other and sort of use that community to push each other to be to sort of improve your writing, to meet deadlines, to reach your goals. And I think that can really help you get uh, where you want to be. That's a great parting thought. Uh, you guys, thanks again so much for coming out today and for being part of this panel. Really appreciate it. Everyone at home, please give them a big round of applause. Uh, thanks again. And you guys all have a great Comic-Con. Take care.